Miriam Meets on RTE Radio 1 with Miriam O'Callaghan. My four guests this morning are great friends and have lived lives steeped in music. They came of age in the 60s and early 70s when there was a renaissance and transformation of Irish trad music as it engaged with folk and rock. At different times, in different combinations, they played with each other. Some played in Planksty, others in the Bothy Band, and their musical lives continue to interweave. It is hard to overestimate the contribution that they have made individually to Irish music. And they're now playing together as a band called L.A. PD with their next gig here in Dublin in Vicker Street next Sunday, December the 16th. So, LAPD, you're very welcome. It's Liam O'Flynn, Andy Irvine, Paddy Dlacken and Donald Lunny. You're all really welcome. Thanks, Thanks Ryan. Thank you. Take it away with a bit of music. The great thing is you're going to play live for us this morning. So what are you going to start off with? We're going to play a reel uh, yeah. called O'Keefe's Plough. Okay. Named after a great fiddle player from Kerry, a man named Podrick O'Keefe. And of course, Liam, you're in the Ellen Pipes. Yes. Paddy, tell people what you're playing. I'm on, I'm on the fiddle. Andy? Yeah. Mandola. Donald? Uh, the, the bazooki. Okay, over you go and take it away. That was fantastic. Come back over here, the four of you. <laughs> uh, do you like playing together? You must love playing together. Yeah, always an enjoyable experience. Mm, yeah. Where did you all meet each other? For instance, Donal Lunny, Andy Irvine, where did you mm. both meet first? Uh, in a previous century, uh, I, was, uh, I was a student in the College of Art. I'd heard about Andy and I was in complete awe of him oh. because he played several instruments. I was still just playing guitar at that time. And, oh, yeah. And uh, I really wanted to meet you. And w- one afternoon you arrived at... The, the house in which I was staying and I answered the door and you were standing there festooned with instruments you had a vision <laughs> you said Is there any, are there any flats to let in here and I said well, you can sleep on my floor <laughs> I really wanted you to come in but you went away again did I not come in because I'd read about uh, I'd re- I was looking for a flat mm. or a room or something mm. and uh, I'd found that address in the evening press or something like that right yeah and there you were. But I never even came in. <laughs> no. So when a, did you meet? So a, a bit later on, I, I can't remember when we first started playing, but we did meet up soon after well, that. Well, I can yeah. remember that. Can you? Yes. Oh, great. Andy has a memory. <laughs> well, Sean McRaymond, <laughs> oh, yes. rest his soul, was, uh, yeah. he, was the, was he the chairman or something of the, of the Irish Soviet Friendship Society? Oh, yeah, okay. Right. And uh, <laughs> they were having their annual get-together. Sean asked us, I don't know whether it was individually or together, would, would we play at, uh, just do a, a short set at the, um, mm. the thing? Right. Where was it yeah, held? Yeah. Can you remember that? Aylesbury Road or somewhere like that, was it? Was it? Yeah, mm. some, you know, one of those big But we had about five like minutes to rehearse and we, we rehearsed three numbers or something yeah. like that. And, and I remember being gobsmacked by uh, the speed at which Donald... Uh, latched on to what I was doing and it we got terror. on the stage and we were we were wonderful and the audience <laughs> gave us a huge round of applause. Well, I don't know if they did or not. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, they did. They, yeah, did. No, they yeah. did. And you, Liam, as an Ilham Pie player, when did you meet these three guys? When did I meet these three? I think I met uh, Donald in Prosperous probably originally. Yep. Prosperous, a small village in County Kildare. And uh, it was a, sort of like a little oasis of, of traditional music. There was a family there called the Rin family who are still there. And there was Davok Rin and Andy Rin, Bridget Rin. And they were really into the music. And I reckon it was their interest and stuff that, you know, started yeah. that whole business of the Wednesday session in Prosperous. But that's where yeah. I would have I met Donald. Uh, right, Andy yeah. I would have met, I think, in one of the, the folk clubs, maybe the tradition club, which was mm. terrific. Another Wednesday night. Business in Slatteries, yeah, in yeah. Slatteries and yeah. Capel Street, yeah. yeah. Paddy, Paddy, probably out in the what's the hotel? The Hollybrook Hotel. The Hollybrook hotel. Can in you Clinton remember? Well, no, it's just, it's just you know, I don't remember the first time I met Liam, but I do remember kind of getting to know him just because it's a very small community, the traditional music community at that stage. And there used to be a session, and Liam used to come to the session with his teacher, Leo Rosen, mm. oh, yeah. uh, after yes. his lesson. And that's where I first encountered Liam. Uh, first encountered Donald, I remember, in the basement of the Shelburne Hotel. 
As you well, do. Uh, as, a, wow. as, a, as, a, as a Planksty gig. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I, rem- I remember as well. Yeah. That was, and I think I first there. then came, met Andy probably, I say again, probably Slattery's. Yeah, I don't remember the first time I met you. No, I don't. In there's fact, no I official. The last time I met you. <laughs> What's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> but the three of you, Bar, Paddy, all ended up in Planksty. So how mm-hmm. did that come about? Christy, I think, uh, drew us together by... Christy Moore. Of Christy Moore. Well, we were we were nearly always in touch. In fact, Christy and I were sh- sharing a, a bed sit um, before he left for England. He was away for five years. He had recorded an album over there. He wanted to record an album in Ireland with Irish musicians. So he contacted me and uh, and almost immediately Andy because we were playing together at the time, and uh, he had uh, mustered about nine or ten musicians for the recording of Prosperous, Mm -hmm. and Liam was among them as well, because we all knew each other from Pat Dowling's and Prosperous, and uh, um, uh, we actually recorded it in Rin's house, in the basement of Rin's house. Yeah, Yeah, and it was a wonderful experience. It really was, yeah. Yeah. When was that about? 71. 71. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was the sort of, that's that sowed the seeds for Planksty really, because Christy went away again and came back, and it was like, hey, why don't we get together, you know? Mm. So the four of us um, uh, took it from there. And, you're going and to I think it was on that recording that that, mm. that great sort of moment where Tourdom the Love and the Raggle Taggle Gypsy yeah. met each other. That's right. Two yeah, tunes. Yeah, which was a really sort of yeah. key thing yeah. in, in terms of Planksty and the road that we took afterwards, you know, uh, right. which was the combination of songs and traditional music. But did you realise mm. how big you were when you were in Planksty? Did you appreciate the success then of how big Planksty was? I don't know. I don't I think don't any know. of us had any notion of the sort of impact we were making. We were uh, listening to Gay Byrne one morning on his morning uh, a radio programme and he was ecstatic about this new band called Planksty and mm. we were absolutely gobsmacked by the mm. yeah, this by happening. Yeah. Do you remember the, the, the hanger? Very that, well that's indeed, what, yeah. That was the most amazing <coughs> night I think I've ever experienced. Mm. Tell me about that. We were invited to, to open for Donovan, who had an Irish band at the time, through some contact of yours, Donald, I'm sure. Mm, I think so, yeah. But the first gig yeah. of the tour was in, was in the hangar, the old hangar ballroom in, uh, in Galway. So, so okay. in Salt Hill, and we, yeah. Yes, and we got there. And I, I had never seen so many microphones and lights and everything. It was quite, quite kind of uh, frightening. Our sound check was perfunctory because uh, the, the sound man was Donovan's brother-in-law and he, you know... He, this is the, the support band, right? Yeah, okay, lads, that's great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, and we got on and we came, we, we, we played our, our set and about, about 15 minutes into it, I suddenly realised something f- was happening in the audience that was kind mm. of, uh, I thought it was a fight. I thought it was a row going on. Mm. Uh, and I looked at the lads and they all had, had smiles like that, <laughs> you know, from ear to ear. And I realised it couldn't be a fight. And, and then <laughs> yeah. I thought, well, hey, we are going down ecstatically, <laughs> and and it was the most incredible. Remember the yeah. end of the, the when we got off the stage, mm. they went berserk. Mm. That must have been such a, a an it amazing was, feeling. It was amazing, and I suppose unexpected. You exactly, know. that was mm. the point. We were, we were not expecting anything like that. That right? wasn't your first gig, was it? Together, it was the first main gig. We'd, mm. we'd yeah. done one in Newbridge before that. You yeah. weren't with them, Paddy, in no. that, but you would have seen them live. What, oh, what were they like? Well, I mean, Liam was talking there about not realizing the impact. Well, I would have had an an idea of what the impact was because at the time in 1972 I was I was in UCD at the time and I always remember there was a concert you did in, in UCD Tony McMahon did support mm. that mm. night and it was filmed yeah. by I think a French film crew mm. uh, and I always remember like the Theatre L in Belfield and the place was absolutely stuffed and you know for people of my generation yeah. people who say weren't particularly into the music reacting to to the songs like the Raggle Taggle Gypsy and tunes like The Wise Maid you know, and to see how yeah. that was accepted was absolutely phenomenal, and it was it had a massive impact. There's no doubt about that. How many years at that stage did Planks to go for when it was really successful before it came to an end? But two and a half, half, three years. Three at the outside, yeah. Not yeah. that yeah. long, given the no. impact. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Well, yeah, Donald yeah. wasn't Donald. You were only in the band for about eighteen months. Yeah, eighteen months to two mm. years, something like that. And why did it come <clears> to an end? Well, uh, I I was very restless, and I wanted to try other uh, music. You know, yeah. again, I was completely blind to, uh, if you like, the sort of importance of Planksty at the time. Liam and Andy, were you sad when it ended? Well, 
Well, Liam is smiling. It, it actually, Why are you smiling? <laughs> I'm laughing now. I, but it went on for another year and a half after he left. Go on. Mm. Yeah. Well, okay, I, can I tell the story? Go Can on, I tell the story? Because I always remember uh, <laughs> Liam rang up everybody and said, I'd like to call a meeting. And we knew what it was about because we were, we were run down. But like it, this is quite, quite a few years later, isn't it? Yes, it was yeah. uh, December 75, actually, after, after that I French it's tour. Yeah. Amazing, this man. Well, can, well up, and, up to a point. <laughs> I can't remember what, what happened yesterday. But, uh, <laughs> So we knew what you knew. We knew what he was calling the meeting for. I was uh, really concerned and worried about the notion of you know how am I going to explain all this, explain it to. The, but I was also aware at that stage the band wasn't you know wasn't really going anywhere as such. Uh, we were all exhausted really from travel, yeah. you know, which is seems to be the way of new bands. Like I mean, you get worked to death mm. on the road, mm. and I, I was you know I was aware as well that the rest of the people in the band were you know if not feeling exactly like me. They were very close to it, <laughs> but yeah, it was it was the right. I think it was the right decision at that time. And the Bothy band, of course, was hugely successful too. And that was you, Paddy. How did that come well, about? It wasn't just me; it was six or seven other people. Um, well, basically, what happened there was that was about 1973. We were all we were all just we all knew each other, a bunch of musicians around, and we were asked to play at the Guidin 21st um, anniversary, and they had an exhibition going at a place called Ireland House in Stevens Green. Mm. And we would go in there and do a lunchtime gig every day. Donald, Michal O'Donnell, uh, the late Michal O'Donnell, yeah. Trina, myself and Matt Malloy. And we, we just kind of enjoyed doing what we were doing mm. and we enjoyed the music. And it just kind of grew on from there. We just decided, well, let's, let's do a few gigs together. And we were, at that stage, we, were, we weren't known as the Bothy Band. We were known as uh, uh, Curum which I think is a kind mm. of a, an abbreviation of, you know, of concert. Mm. And then it became Shachter. And then we christened the band, the Bathy band, in the Earl of Maxima and Cork. Oh, it, bless uh, your memory. Yeah, uh, that's the night we stayed in the Vienna Woods Hotel. Do you oh, remember, I that? remember that? <laughs> remember that night? <laughs> oh, tell me about that <laughs> night. The most, the most bizarre conversation I think I ever had about neurosurgeons yeah. <laughs> until about <laughs> five o'clock. <laughs> Led by Tony we'd say no more. Led by Tony McMahon, of course. Yeah. Yes, that's oh, thirty yeah. years ago. You still remember that conversation? Yeah, well, you could never forget it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you left two weeks, did you, before you, did, that, yeah. you about, recorded about, the first album? Yeah, Why? About, about a month, two weeks to a month Why? before. But at that stage, I realised that if, if it was going to be an album, it's going to entail an awful lot of work and a lot of travelling and an awful lot of you know, uh, commitment to try and work the album. And I really w- wasn't, that was a challenge to me and I really wasn't up for that, to be honest mm-hmm. about it. And it seemed like the honourable thing to do at that stage was, look, don't go there, don't do record an album and then two weeks after you've recorded it to walk away from it. Mm-hmm. That would have been unfair. So I thought that was the best thing to do. Is it because you found being in a band difficult? I mean, is the life, it's quite nomadic, I suppose. It's, um, it's hard to... Um to live a normal life when you're yeah. playing in a band because the sort of tours come up and you have to sort of drop everything off you go, you know. Um, so it is it is it is disruptive, yeah. But good crack? Ah, oh, sure, brilliant crack, yeah. <laughs> Do you ever fight? Yeah, no mm. problem. <laughs> <laughs> but would you make up then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'd make up with a few tunes, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a love story. <laughs> but this band, LAPD, is mm. it kind of sweet playing together? Oh, I think it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 During the course of last year, we, how many times did we play? Six or seven, Six or seven times. Um, there wasn't, there isn't the same, you know, sort of pressure of the sort of new band assembling and trying to make yeah. it, you know. Continuous yeah. lifestyle. Exactly. Yeah. But it's like, yeah. you've all made it, frankly, so now you can just enjoy it. Yeah, and I think the fact that, well, you know, when Planksty reassembled, for example, back in whenever it was, oh, four or five, the original, mm. band, what was that? <laughs> March 2004. Oh, an encyclopedia <laughs> of <laughs> dates. <laughs> Living diary. <laughs> Terrific. Terrific, yeah. I think one of the reasons that it was so acceptable, if you like, to, the, to people in general mm. was the fact that we'd all, it wasn't as though we'd stopped mm. making mm. music mm. after, you know, Planksty had stopped. No, you were all but playing we, yourself. But we had all carved out music, really mu- successful musical careers. successful musical mm. careers so that the coming together was very real. You very know, nice, uh, yeah. And, and, and it's lovely, but yeah. isn't he going to play a piece for me now? What are you going to play for me now? Um, this is uh, two jigs. The first one's called The Rambles of Kitty and the second one is called The Humours of Ennis Time. OK, away you go. One, two, three, four.
was great, guys. Come back over. Will you be playing them at Vicar Street next Sunday? We will. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. How many years have you been playing tunes like that? Certainly Liam and myself have been playing the first one uh, for a terrible long time. <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, that's, that's, that's certainly for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a very old uh, tune. It's a very old tune, uh, the, the, the Rambles of Kitty. Uh, indeed, Liam, there's a, there was a record made in 1968 which Liam played on called The Rambles of Kitty. Yes, yeah. indeed, yeah. Uh, everyone, I've spoken to so many people, Liam, and they, I'd never met you until today, actually, and they talk about you almost godlike, this amazing Ilan yeah. player. Where did you yeah. learn and get your love for the Ilan Pipes? From my family. My mother was from County Clare, Milltown Malbay, as it happens originally. So I guess I'm related to the Clare tradition through her. My father uh, was from County Kerry and he played the fiddle. So, you know, I was listening to, to music and friends would come in, musical friends uh, to my parents and there'd be sessions. And I can clearly remember as a, as a little child in bed listening to the music downstairs. I always think of it as, you know, really happy uh, memories. Uh, That's so the nice. The only unhappy musical memories I have is when I was put to learning the piano in Nace and I was being taught by this nun. <coughs> and uh, It still it, sounds painful. It, it, it was painful because I used to get belted across the knuckles with this. She had a, an, a pencil with a, a, an extraordinary end on it. But it all ended <laughs> anyway when she... One day she got so frustrated with me, she pushed me off the piano stool. <laughs> and I thought I didn't mind it. Well, she burst into tears anyway. She was so upset. With I, your playing I, or I, that she pushed I, you? Well, I'd say both. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that was kind of, that was the end really of my piano playing. And where and when did you pick up the Ellen Pipes? I was, what, 10, 10, 11 years of age. And my father actually knew Leo Rousam, who was the great, great piper and a, a um, absolute master pipe maker um, and uh, I'd said to my father one day you know I'd really love to, to have a set of pipes or you know practice pipes so he got on to Lear Housen and uh, this practice set of pipes appeared bag bellows and chanter mm. and uh, yeah that that was that was a, 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 a fantastic uh, just happening in my life because yeah and I was desperately lucky to have Lear Housen as, as my first yeah. teacher because he was a great teacher, he was a great piper, and of course he was a great pipe maker. So it was it was ideal. They look very difficult to play, are they? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of sort of physical coordination involved in terms mm. of pumping the bellows uh, into the air, into the, the, the bag, uh, reservoir of air, and then keeping the right pressure on that, to, mm. you know, into seven reeds in the instrument. I remember one time in England doing a concert and... Uh, I'm so sorry I don't still have the programme because the programme said in the programme notes, Liam O'Flynn, villain pipe. <laughs> <laughs> Which so okay, then, whether it was a mistake <laughs> or whether it was by design, I don't know. But it, What about your uh, background, Donald? How did you get into music and where did you grow up? Born in Tullamore, grew up in Newbridge from the age of five and in fact, I kind of had a similar experience with the piano at that age. Uh, <laughs> except it wasn't a nun, it was Mrs. Hangelite, who was uh, an Estonian woman, a very, very nice woman from down the road. But I, I do still think that, that that, just that six months or whatever it was that I was learning the piano, that, they, that I, that just sowed the seeds of my music. Really? Yeah, just, mm. the, just um, I suppose, taking in what the piano was, you know, the scales and the, the notes, mm. semitones, the whole thing. It's laid out, it's very, very logical. I think it still stands to me, you know. And then uh, I, Joey O'Shea in secondary school started a, a, a rock band and uh, I, I found a kit of drums, which I bought for about 50 pence. <laughs> but uh, that was great. Uh, but I became very interested in guitar. There were three guitars in the band and uh, I became completely obsessed with the guitar after that and so I borrowed one and eventually uh, my father allowed me to buy one uh, even though it was a bit not at a good time in my school because I was coming up to the evening cert I, I just couldn't put it down you but never put it down never no <laughs> an important moment was again Andy here had a pile of instruments in the corner of his room and I used to go and sort of root through them there were things like Bulgarian pipes and cavals pan pipes all kinds of stuff. And one day I pulled out this bazooki and uh, I started playing it. And I was still playing it three hours later. 
And Andy said, take it, get out of here, take it home with you. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And I, I reversed the strings on it. Why did it. you reverse the strings? Well, I'm left-handed. And okay. I, was, I had been playing it upside down. But when I did that, I put all, unison strings on it, which kind of changed the nature of the instrument a bit. But uh, Andy very kindly gave it to me. Um, so you only play the bazooki really because of Andy Irvine. This is true. You owe a lot to him. I sure do. <laughs> this mutual, is, this, mutual, this is true. Yeah, yeah. It changed everything, yeah. And Paddy, you got a fiddle when you were five or six, did you? My sixth birthday. I was expecting something else and I was given a fiddle. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I, I, I was expecting a pair of football boots, to be honest with you. And uh, it, uh, so these, uh, this fiddle was given to me and I was brought to my first fiddle lesson in the College of Music. Clara Green was my teacher. Lovely name. Very, very nice woman. Mm. Uh, and like the two lads, I just, just didn't take to this stuff too well. I um, don't know what it was. I just And the only good thing was the fact that my father played the fiddle and the, he was playing the reels and jigs at home. And that saved me mm-hmm. because there was, you know, he would teach me a few tunes and I, I could make some sort of sense of it. The the, the tedium of the, the scales and arpeggios and the the exercises and all that, I, 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 I didn't take to it very well. And then really like the, the, the day, I suppose, kind of the tabernacle of the music that was sort of opened up to me was when I met John Doherty for the first time. I was about nine or ten. And that was sort of the, that was it. You know, I mean, mm. something just happened that day when like, and it was because of the fact that he asked me to play for him and mm. he said, he said, play me a tune. And, and he said to me, he said, he said, he said, he said, that's very good. He said, you should stay playing the fiddle. Mm. And I did. But that was it, you know. So mm. anyway, but I was very fortunate that the, 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 the traditional music was running parallel to the classical thing. Yeah, you in know. your own family. Mm. Yes, my own family, absolutely. And Andy, you? I was born in London. My mother was a musical comedy actress. My father was uh, had played the saxophone. I got uh, a guitar for my 13th birthday. And uh, I don't know what kind of fiddle you got. And you, you obviously got a good set of uh, practice pipes. I got a brown guitar that must have cost about four pounds, I think. <laughs> and uh, my sister had married a musician and and he knew Julian Bream. So I went, uh, I was brought by my mother to to, uh, to talk to Julian Bream. And the first thing he said was, well, you'll have to get a new guitar. And then he said, um, he said, well, how, how well do you want to play? Because we were talking about him teaching me. And I, I didn't know how to answer that question. So I said, I, I don't know. And he said, well, would you like to play like this? And he played this piece, which had me in floods of tears. You know, I'd never been mm-hmm. that close to uh, an instrument like that before. And I was, yes, I was. I said, oh, yes, I'd love to play like that, wow. <laughs> but I never did get there. Of course, I, I uh, wow. after about three three years, I um, I just figured that uh, practicing three hours a day classical music was not really where I wanted to be at. And at that time, skiffle. I suddenly discovered skiffle, and I and hey, I can play these chords. You know, mm. I'm playing all these bar chords, mm. chomp, 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 mm. chomp, mm. which wasn't the right thing at all. But uh, mm. so that's how I started. Just listening to Andy there talking about when he first heard Julian Bream play mm. and the emotional impact it had. I remember the first time I heard an orchestra play. My parents brought me to uh, I think it was a Gilbert and Sullivan uh, opera in the Gaiety Theatre, and at the very beginning the national anthem was played and the orchestra struck up and I actually almost fainted with the so I'd never heard this this the, you know this kind of sound before yeah. mm. I, I I feel very fortunate that you know down the road I've uh, actually you know through the music of Sean Davy and so on made made music um, brought the eel and pipes I suppose into that that uh, the world Boyd, the Brandon yeah. Voyage and so on yeah but look, you're going to play another piece for me now? We're going to play a song called My, Hearts. My Heart's Night in Ireland. Mm. Yeah, you're which going is, to sing in it? Which Andy Andy yes, yeah. It's yeah. a song about... Uh, it's a, a nostalgic thing. Well, tell about, us about uh, it. You uh, wrote it now. What yes, is it about? Well, it's about uh, yeah. a band, the f- band, first band. It was in Sweeney's Men. Mm. And how in the summer of 1966, we went off in a red Volkswagen van and, and uh, had a wonderful summer. You know, we, we'd no gigs, but we'd play in pubs and people would give us a bit of money or buy us a drink. Or one time, famously, they filled up the tank of the, the van with petrol for us. Oh, when we got back to Dublin uh, after the summer was over, uh, it was a hard, cold winter. And we were all living in the same house together, starving to death, freezing to death. 
and we realised we had become professional musicians. <laughs> <laughs> My heart tonight is far away across the rolling sea In the sweet mill town Malbay And it's there I'd love to be That's a really lovely song, Gorgeous Stand in the Pipes here. Yes, and I remember when I heard this song first, Andy makes mention of the, the great Clare Piper, Willie Clancy. And uh, it occurred to me, I think Willie would have been really, really proud and really pleased. It's so nice to hear that. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm. he certainly would. Because, you know, he, uh, I always wanted to be on kind of first name terms with Willie Clancy. And, and oh. he'd say, ah, Andy, how are you? But the nearest I got to that was he said, you were here before. <laughs> <laughs> so You're kind so. of incredibly lucky, though, I think, all of you who work permanently in music, that it's such a beautiful career to work in. Mm. Do you it's feel a, lucky, Donald? I certainly do, yeah. I think uh, there's, a, there's a privilege in it. it it's lovely to, to, um, to enjoy what I'm doing so much and to be still able to do that at this time in my life, I, I, feel, I feel lucky. I often think of it as like living the dream as far back nearly as I can remember. I love the idea of uh, you know, playing music for other people, performing, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. And uh, it's a feature of traditional music sessions that an individual is asked to now yeah. we'll have you know a tune from so and so or a song from so and so. But uh, yeah, I, you know it is really living the dream if you can. I think well, being a musician, there's a certain insecurity to it as well. You sure. know, sure. Personally, I've kind of bumped along the bottom uh, financially from time to time, uh, but you know, managed to keep afloat. And if you hadn't done music in your lives, what do you think your lives would be like? I, I think I might have been um, a national hunt jockey. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Those were two passions in my life yeah. from the beginning. One was music and the other was horses. That's so mm. interesting. And mm. do you think Mad you... combination. Yeah, good though. And might you have been good enough to do it? <laughs> I've no idea. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I've always kept a huge interest in horses. And, and indeed, I married a, a very uh, distinguished horsewoman. Okay. And very successful, yeah. So, you know, I live with, with, with music and horses 24 hours a day. It's pretty pleasurable. Andy was doing an imitation of you there, playing the that, yeah. pipes on the horse, oh, going along. What, a, what an album that cover. That <laughs> the closest I've ever... Uh, I saw it one time at a, uh, in the Lorient Folk Festival. I heard these pipes in the distance, these Scottish pipes, and I couldn't figure out where the music was coming from. And the next thing, this motorbike came up the road and the fella on the pillin was playing the, the, the <laughs> Scottish bagpipes. <laughs> so you Not Ellen pipes, no. But Paddy, you didn't do it full time no. in your life. You didn't, but you've no regrets about that. No, absolutely not, because I got, got a chance to work on both um, sort of spheres, both music yeah. and my other passion is everybody knows the sport. Mm. I drive everybody to distraction about it. And I got a chance to work in sport here, but I started in sport and I wound up working in all the different departments and I ended up back in sport as the head of the radio sports department. And I just left here three months ago. We wonderful. miss you, Pat. I, I, I had an absolutely wonderful time. I had a really wonderful time. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the whole milieu of sport uh, so much, you know, and... Uh, and, you know, it, it was a wonderful opportunity. But, uh, you know, all along the music ran parallel to it. And it was great. Like for five years, I worked in the Arts Council as the traditional music officer. And the sport was a great saviour for me to get away from the intensity of all that was going on there. And the music then was sort of the, the saviour to get away from the intensity of the sport mm. when it was going on. So it, it, it worked very well for me. And I really, you know, and I still, you know, I'm, I'm still like, you know, I, I can't pass a television if there's something on. I have to have to go sit down and look at it, you know. That's just the way it is. I think I read something that you described music as the oxygen of the emotions. Ooh, ooh. ooh it was very. There, but, there's a yeah. phrase. Yeah. I, o- o- yeah. I, I, what do you somebody mean? Somebody asked me, um, "What would the world be like without music?" And I thought we'd all go nuts. And uh, it occurred to me that music is, is a sort. It's like oxygen. Um, and then mm. the word for the emotions followed that. So, you know, that was really philosophical, wasn't it? Yeah, no, but it's true. <laughs> I mean, Andy, yeah. you've been yeah. singing and playing. For decades. And do you l- love the experience? Like when you go out next Sunday in Vicar Street, will you enjoy that as much as you've always enjoyed doing music or will you enjoy it even more? I'll enjoy it uh, to the full. I, mm. I don't know whether it'll be more or, or <clears throat> whatever, but 
uh, we've been rehearsing the last uh, couple of days and I, I, it's been ecstatic, you know. I mean, mm. one, one projects oneself into the audience and, and uh, the first four or five numbers you think, yes, this is, this is a strong, this is going to be great, you know. And as Donald said, you know, after the first three or four numbers are really well received, you can relax and just enjoy the rest of the night. Mm. And so I am really looking forward to walking onto that stage. Indeed I am, yeah. And when you're on stage, I mean, obviously, if I'm in the audience, I just see you playing. But do you have lots of, like, your own crack together? Do you have looks at each other? Like, you know, oh, yes. yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Or you can see a glance across the stage. <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole other layer of activity there is going on. Yeah, that's true, yeah. The music is a, it's a kind of a journey, you know. It's kind of like you're, you're traveling the tune or the song or whatever. There's a sort of a shared yes. a- anticipation, in, mm. you know, in, in, in the songs and, and in the tunes yeah. that you know that are sort of significant parts coming up and you will look at each other yeah. at, at, at different times when that happens, yeah. You've played together so much, weird. do you know each other really well? I'd say pretty well, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, man, though, do you talk about your emotions and things? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Patty's just smiling. <laughs> do you have... Deep conversations or not? Or do you just have fun? Mm. You know, there will be moments when, you know, something can come up and you can have, a, you know, a, a pretty straightforward conversation about it and, and you don't feel inhibited, mm. you know, and I think that's the most important and thing, you know. Yeah. And to feel comfortable, you know, that you can say mm. something mm. without it be, becoming, mis- mm. you know, you know, interpreted in a different sort of way. Mm. You know, you, you, basically you're talking about being honest, mm. Mm. you know, and that's really what it's about, I think, mm. you know. Mm. Yeah. And I suppose you don't want to lay anything heavy on, on the other people as well, do you know? But if you're worried about something, mm. would you confide in each other or not? In my case, probably not. <laughs> but what yeah. kind of thing would you, would you be talking about? know if someone close to you was ill or... You would share that, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I think so, yeah. I mean, mm. because that affects, you know, what you're going to do on the stage. I mean, obviously, like, if, if it's affecting your mm. form and if your form is not good, then that's affecting everybody else around you so therefore like you know I mean that's I think that would be pretty natural to to share that sort of, of a burden mm. in that sense and to know that it was being accepted is even yeah, better again you know it's a professional relationship but it's there are friendships as well you mm. know so that's it so it's both do you think music can be spiritual mm. yeah. oh completely yes you know I mean it's it's music is such a powerful uh, language of communication of emo- you know emotional mm. communication it's uh, you know f- from time to time, maybe somebody, will, you know, you meet somebody after a concert and they'll say, that particular tune or that yeah. particular song really, you know, had me in tears or yeah. really elated me or something. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. it's a huge reward, I think, for a musician to, yeah. to receive that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and uh, music, it, you can interpret it on several different levels, you know. So mm. it can fit various states of mind, you know. Mm. You can be really happy and the music can make you higher or you can be very sad and the music will still you know come to you whatever you know so and as we come to a close I mean I suppose you said earlier music can be spiritual I'm just interested on a Sunday are you spiritual Liam are you religious I'm spiritual yeah do you think you'll meet these you guys? Ask me very hard questions now no no I'm just going <laughs> to say do you think you'll meet these guys and play with them in heaven uh, I doubt it somehow or another you Paddy I'm not sure Andy? I always figure that we, as the human race, we know so little of what uh, is available f- in knowledge that we we really have no right to, to make any comment at all about this, you know. It's um, like asking a fish, what's it like it? on dry land? <laughs> 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 but I, th- yeah, I think we'll all meet. I'd see you in 25 years' time or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think uh, it doesn't stop here. That's sweet. Do you think that, Donald? Yes, I do, yeah. And he says it with such authority, I think I believe him. Conviction. Yeah. Oh, yes. No doubt in my mind. Why are you so sure of that? Because of, um, uh, I I suppose, a number of incidents of uh, people being revisited by people who had passed on, commonly called ghosts. Yeah. I mean, which could be like some kind of a, a time loop. Because time time is a very peculiar thing, but I think that every, everybody's there's a, a continuum, and you know that's a really nice the, way to end. Actually. We're in the chrysalis stage at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd be playing with these guys in about twenty five years. No, no bother. Yeah. Somewhere else, <laughs> be frogs. Then, <laughs> <laughs> 
But look, we're going to play, and you're going to play me one last piece of music. It's a song written by a, um, <clears throat> a friend of mine called Andy Mitchell, mm. and it's called uh, Indiana. And it's about, um, I'm not sure it was one person or two people who went to America mm. quite early in their lives, lived there in Indiana, were content enough, but never found it was quite home. And when they got a bit older, they decided to come home again. Great. And it's a bit of music before it called The Dream. Beautiful. Well, go and play that. It's been a real pleasure having you today. And playing live has been a double pleasure. Liam O'Flynn, Paddy Glacken, Andy Irvine. Donal Lonnie, keep playing and I know next Sunday night the 16th of December in Vicker Street your band LAPD are playing tickets from the usual outlets thanks on sound thank today thanks to Andrew me. Kane to my producer Eileen Heron I'll be here at the same time next Sunday until then thank you very much for listening we're going out listening to Indiana <laughs>